You're all very welcome. And we're going to start with some short, sharp presentations from each of them. And we're going to start um, with Deborah. Deborah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here today and speak to the audience about the uh, actions that are being taken um, in Northern Ireland in relation to te technology enabled care. There's much about what has already been said today which resonates with our strategy and the direction of travel in Northern Ireland. We do start from a position of strength in that we are a relatively small region. Our population is 1.8 million and we have had integrated health and social care structures in place since 1973. However, we share with the rest of the UK and indeed much of the developed world the challenges of the ageing population and an associated increasing prevalence of long-term conditions. Over recent years, we have been engaged in a comprehensive reform programme known as Transforming Your Care, which is aimed at reconfiguring the care model to focus services more closely around patients. It has led to the establishment in Northern Ireland of 17 integrated care partnerships. These collaborative networks of care providers are playing a significant role in promoting a more coordinated, patient-focused approach to prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care in their respective localities. The use of innovative technology is a central plank to this reform agenda. We know that our current system um, suffers from being reactive when it needs to be more focused on upstreaming interventions to improve prevention and address lifestyle issues. Technology gives us the capability to interface with and empower citizens at every stage of their health experience, maintaining health, receiving care and managing long-term conditions. Since 2011, we have been lucky in that Northern Ireland has seen the implementation of regional telemonitoring and telecare services, as well as new technological systems which are having a positive impact in terms of information sharing, streamlining processes and reducing bureaucracy. One of our flagship initiatives has been the Northern Ireland Electronic Care Record. This is essentially a portal which draws information from clinical systems across the region to give health and care professionals access to key information they require about their patients, enabling quicker decision making and driving up safety and quality of care. Building on these foundations, we have developed an e-health and care strategy which is nearing finalisation. It sets out our plans for further embedding the use of technology between now and 2020. Key priorities include making health and care services more accessible to the public with new tools such as the online health portal, provision for online GP appointment bookings and prescriptions, and the facility for individuals to access their medical records. Ensuring that the data being gathered throughout the NICECR is being maximised for the purposes of health research, predictive analytics, care planning and the evolution of personalised medicine. To grow our health and analytics capability, a collaborative network involving Northern Ireland's Economic Department Agency, InvestNI, University of Ulster and a number of companies has developed a demonstrator data analytics platform, which we intend to use for learning and skills development. Fostering partnership is also very important between the healthcare sector, industry and our universities to promote healthcare innovation. We have until now recently been using the Northern Ireland, Economic, or Northern Ireland Connected Health Ecosystem, which has focused its attention specifically on technological innovation. Next year, we plan to take this a stage further with the launch of a health innovation and life sciences hub. This will facilitate engagement and collaborative working, not only in the area of technology development, but right across the spectrum of health and life sciences. Looking beyond this, we have recently been researching the implementation of a regional electronic health and care record facility. Unlike our existing NIECR system, which provides a window into a number of systems across our various providers, this would be a single consolidated system. And it would be based on the principle of once for Northern Ireland. We would move away from a situation where individual organisations deploy their own electronic record keeping tools. Our work to, suggest, to date suggests that there are significant benefits in terms of the integration of a system in this manner, leading to safer outcomes 
no doubt with lots of challenges in implementing such a significant system. So it is clear that our priorities in pursuing our e-health and care agenda chime with those in other parts of the UK. It is also evident that while there are particularly advantages in being a small devolved administration, there are also limitations. For this reason, we recognise the value of engagement on this agenda with our counterparts in England, Scotland and Wales. We believe that Northern Ireland has much to offer, but clearly there is also a great deal to learn from others through such networks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Can I invite uh, Dr. Paul Rice to come and address us now, please? Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this morning. Um, I just wanted to build a little bit on the words of uh, George Freeman. Um, significantly, uh, Paul Burst, who was our chair, introduced the five year forward view in his opening remarks. And I think it's really important to recognize that. Sorry, is that better? I think it's really important to recognize that a week after the five-year forward view was published, the National Information Board published their personalized health and care 2020 document, which fundamentally asserted the extent to which this agenda that we're talking about for the next two days is no longer a marginal agenda, but a mainstream one. It's no longer an optional agenda, but a vital one. And we're, on the, we're now at the stage of getting into the meat, getting into the implementation plans and the support for implementation for local health and care economies to push this agenda forward. Personalised Health and Care 2020 invited local health and care economies to organise themselves in footprints, footprints to deliver and develop local digital roadmaps, which outline in detail how they will step forward to deliver this agenda. And we're currently engaging all of the suppliers in, uh, in the NHS, the NHS family, uh, to uh, do a baseline maturity assessment of where they are in relation to this agenda. And I think fundamentally importantly for this audience today, we're asking those organisations to outline where they are in relationship to the remote and assistive care agenda as, most, as much as we're asking them to outline where they are in what might have been historically the agenda that people thought about when they thought about technology and healthcare the patient record, the transaction agenda. All of these agendas need to move forward in syncope with one another. They all need to move forward together. Um, and we think the work to encourage and support local health and care economies to describe in great detail what their plans are in the next 12 months, the next three years, and the next five years will give us a firm grip and a firm understanding of people's intentions, plans, and the detailed steps they're going to take towards implementation. At the same time, there's a radical agenda about the new models of care. People looking at in Vanguard with the Prime Minister's Challenge Fund and a whole set of other areas of innovation. How do we integrate this technology agenda into the mainstream? How do we ensure that it's not a digital agenda but a people-based agenda? How do we ensure that whether you're in primary care, in acute and community, in social care, the opportunity that technology and technology-enabled care brings to actually activate the patients, to activate the communities, to draw carers into this conversation. It's absolutely and fundamentally vital that we do that in the next 12 months, in the next 24 months, and the plans are laid out to ensure that we can do that. The challenge to industry, the challenge to colleagues in the room, there are still challenges around integration, these technologies and these opportunities around the individual, their family and their community. Interoperability will be a phrase that may be repeated time and time again over the next two days. Um, this isn't the technology agenda, it's a people-powered agenda, but the technology absolutely has to be fit for purpose. My last challenge to conference really over the next couple of days is picking up again the point that our convener made earlier on. We need to be able to describe the benefits of this in clear and concise terms. We need to be able to describe the benefits as far as the professionals are concerned, to encourage them to move their practice on, because this agenda will not succeed if clinical workflows, if virtual teams, if the relationships between professionals and carers and professionals and service users don't transform. We need to engage the public. We need the pull factor that Alison highlighted in her opening remarks. We need people demanding that these opportunities exist for them in their local systems, in their local services, in the relationships that they want to have. And we absolutely need to realize the potential, the untapped potential that exists in each one of us taking a different stake in our own healthcare, 
having different insights about our own health care, having different insights about our own health and well-being, and the part that we can play in managing our conditions, managing our health and managing our wellness. The solutions for that are absolutely and fundamentally within this room. And we, I am convinced that over the next two years, we will have woven those increasingly into the new models of care, the routine business of the NHS and social care. And when we come together in 12 and 24 months, this room will be exuberant and exultant about the change and the difference that together we can make. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Exuberant and exultant. That's a very high bar to set. So we'll uh, make a note of that for uh, two years from now. We'll be having you back, Paul. Um, right, so our next uh, contributor is Ivan. Um, Ivan, would you like to come and address the uh, conference? Thank you. Um, oh, that's loud. Um, Borada, uh, welcome to Wales. I feel obliged to say that um, as the representative of the Welsh Government. And a caveat before I start that the nine scariest words in the English language, according to Ronald Reagan, are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, so that's something that we try to bring to the way that we support uh, industry and the NHS and patients to engage more with technology um, in a way that is enabling uh, rather than prescriptive and directive. Um, I, I, I want to start as well, pick up on that um, last comment about exuberance um, to say that it's very easy for us to slip into talking about the challenges that we face, um, about the changing demographic, about lifestyle challenges and uh, the reduced resources that we have available. Um, but at the same time, what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years in technology is an enormous opportunity. There are things that are almost unrecognizable from the last time that we went through a cycle of digital and technology strategies in the UK. Um, the iPad and the iPhone were only invented, only became available in the last 10 years, and yet probably half the people in the room have one in their pockets at the moment. The smart devices that you hold on you right now and that patients hold have more computing power than uh, many of the desktop machines on desks across the NHS. And there's an enormous opportunity there for us that we don't grasp. Mobile connectivity, smart devices, uh, big data, and uh, the, the the cheapness of being able to store vast quantities of data, the falling cost of, um, of biomarkers and genetic testing, um, the new personalized manufacturing, uh, additive layer manufacturing and other things, um, and the software intelligence that are available. These are all tools that didn't really exist at the level um, that, that we have now, uh, and we can't really predict where they'll be in the next five or six years. But within that opportunity and challenge, I think there's also a challenge for us, which is that if we, and by we I mean public health provision, the NHS, local authorities, care providers, uh, care which is free at the point of use, which is a founding principle for all of the NHS systems in the UK, if we don't do that, then companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple will do that, and they will hold patient data, they will be empowered as long, alongside patients, and that will be a, a significant challenge for us down, down the road. Over the remainder of the probably three minutes I've got left, I just want to say something about the different structure of the NHS in, in Wales. Um, it is very distinctly different to the NHS in England. Most of the debate has been about the NHS in England, and rightly so, because it's by far the largest part of the NHS. But there are four different flavors, if you like. Um, we don't have foundation trusts in Wales. We don't have uh, commissioning groups. We don't have tariff. Um, we don't have a competitive market. Uh, we don't allocate resources through comp competition, but rather through planning. Um, through a much simpler system of seven integrated health boards. Those health boards each have a statutory duty. Uh, their remit is to take care of the entire health needs of their resident populations from public health prevention through primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary care. Um, that is very, very powerful and the fact that they are recently designated as university health boards is also very powerful. I sometimes think that a university hospital is going to focus its efforts on making the hospital even better. That's not necessarily what we need these days. We want to reduce the burden on hospitals and increase what's delivered in community and in primary care. And university health boards are better remitted in many ways to be able to do that. Um, and we've also discussed, and there's a great deal, I don't often get to comment on what a UK minister um, has, has said, um, but there's an awful lot that, um, that George said that is very, very similar to the core messages from our own health minister here in Wales, Mark Drakeford. And what they both say links into an international thinking on healthcare value. Um, and the last section of what I want to say is about value. Um, value is not just saving money. 
uh, if you look at the work from Michael Porter and others, value they would describe as outcomes over cost. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. So healthcare outcomes and patient experience are very important and resource utilization is probably better than a focus just on the money because time costs too. Um, and if that's what we're looking at internationally, that's what all developed health systems are, are looking at, the same challenges being faced really. Um, we have a particular interpretation of that in Wales set out by the health minister um, called Prudent Healthcare. And it picks up on many of the themes uh, that, uh, that George Freeman mentioned, although obviously it's better um, because um, I report to the health minister in Wales that I'm a Welsh government civil servant. Um, it has four principles. You can do a Google search on Prudent Healthcare to look it up. Um, it is about co-production and making patients equal partners, not just in decisions about their healthcare, but in accountability and responsibility for the management of their condition. It's not the NHS's job on its own to look after your health needs. You have a role as an individual to play too. It's also about better prioritization of resources, so we're caring for those with the greatest need first. Um, it is, um, it's, it's also about being more intelligent in the interventions, doing what is needed, and particularly doing no harm. The health system does a great deal of harm to people, healthcare acquired infections, trips and falls, other things that happen to them in hospital, and we really do have to focus on removing that, that is in lean methodology, waste, but it has a huge personal cost and people shouldn't have that, um, ha have that happening to them when they come into contact with the health system. And finally, again, picking up on a message from George, it addresses inappropriate variation, uses evidence to identify this using data and digital technology. Um, so, so to finish, part of my title is innovation, and for a while I struggled with the definition of what innovation is. I heard a really good one a couple of weeks ago at a conference in London. Innovation is the ability to turn ideas into invoices. Um, which I thought was a, was a good one. Um, but my preference is, is one from, ironically, Goldman Sachs, not often quoted by um, health policy leads. Um, fresh thinking which creates value. And I use that to say it's not the fresh thinking which is the hard bit. We often say that the culture in the NHS is the problem. People say to me, it's not an innovative organization. And yet whenever I speak to clinicians or people in care or anybody involved with health, they, they're, they're spouting ideas all over. We could, we could generate that 200 good ideas here in this room. Some original, some taken from your experiences elsewhere. It's not the fresh thinking which is the hard bit. It's the creates value which is the hard bit. Making stuff happen, getting it done. And it's not just the getting it done, and this is really my challenge to conference, um, it's the getting it done and showing that it was worth doing. Showing that what has been done, that there's a solid, credible evidence that it has enhanced value on those metrics of outcomes, healthcare outcomes, patient experience, and re reduced or more efficient resource utilization. So the important thing, I think, the challenge is, how can industry, patients, local authorities, the NHS, policy professionals, identify those areas where there's the promise of value for all of those parties. It's not a transactional zero-sum game. How can we all find an opportunity for value? But more, more importantly, how can we then get that done and demonstrate to ourselves that value has been created? Because it's only then that we will see technologies being adopted at speed and at scale across our NHS systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And our last contributor is Alistair. Alistair. Thank you very much. And for those of you who are expecting uh, Professor George Crookes to stand at this um, lectern, I apologize. I'm not nearly as humorous as him. I have spent far too long in the government. Uh, I'm now very much a humorless civil servant. Uh, so I, I will uh, try to uh, keep this relatively brief. Um, much like my colleagues from uh, Wales, Northern Ireland, and uh, the UK government representing, obviously, NHS England, um, the challenges that exist in Scotland are exactly the same. Some of the opportunities are identical. We are equally trying to foster a culture of innovation and growth in new products and encouraging uh, SME engagement into our health and care system. Um, and much like, uh, particularly in NHS England, where they have that uh, absolutely fantastic document in Personalised Health and Care 2020, we have some really good frameworks in place in Scotland. We have a 2020 vision whereby we are looking to move as much care as possible into the community so that people are actually able to be looked at within the comfort of, if not their own home, then certainly uh, within their own communities. We have an e-health strategy which sets out our vision for how we're going to be using IT in the healthcare setting, how we're going to use uh, data at a, a much more aggregated level. We have a separate national telehealth telecare delivery plan which sets the framework for how we're actually, what kind of activity we want local areas to uh, to progress on in terms of how they use technology to support people. 
But all of these things ultimately are just frameworks. You can put as many policies and strategies in place as you like, but if you do not then have uh, the resources and the capacity to back up that with, with support for local areas to actually help them in how they implement some of these changes, then nothing is really going to change at all. And I think a good example of that actually goes back to the Minister's speech in terms of how we fought, create a, uh, an environment of innovation and how we do new things and how we use new data, how we actually um, take up some of these new digital technologies to analyze the data to improve patient outcomes. But actually, we already have a wealth of data that we've been generating for years through some of our even basic telecare systems, and we don't use that data at all. We use it to the extent where we know somebody's fallen, we go pick them up. Then what? They're picked up, they have a cup of tea, they go back to their everyday lives. We don't pay any attention to that data that's been generated. The fact that they've fallen isn't, their GPs are not notified, their social care supports are not notified, sometimes their family is not even notified. So if we cannot already use the data that we're currently generating, why can we assume that any data that we generate in the future will actually be used? We can't. So we actually have to start looking at the data that we're generating at the moment and put in place uh, a support package whereby individuals in health and care systems actually have the skills and the capability to analyze that data, to use that data, and put it into their effective planning processes. So one of the things that we're doing in Scotland, we have a, a national technology-enabled care program, um, and as part of that, we have a very distinct strand on improvement capacity and support. And it's about providing support to local areas to actually be able to do some of these transformative changes. It's about looking at some of our national capacity that we have through, for example, we have a national health board called uh, National Services Scotland. And within that, the kind of health data specialists sit. Uh, they're the ones that collect all the national data, but they also have a huge amount of expertise in terms of being able to go and support local areas, look at how the data that they're generating already can be implemented into their everyday health and care delivery. So we have people going across all of Scotland now into all 32 local authority areas and the health and social care partnerships that now exist in Scotland and actually starting to look at the data they're already generating and how that can change things. And I think actually we sometimes forget when we talk about innovation that actually a huge amount of this is already in existence right now and we need to be much smarter at doing that. Um, one of the other approaches that we have in Scotland is, is a mantra that comes out of our Chief Executive for NHS Scotland, which is the idea of once for Scotland. Now I recognise that much like my colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland, we have a significant advantage over England in that we are significantly smaller. There's a lot less of us, so saying once is a, a much easier thing to do than it is in England where you have a, a huge amount of variation uh, by necessity um, as much as anything else. But it's about reducing not just unwanted variation, but also reducing uh, unnecessary duplication of effort uh, and making sure that any uh, devices or approaches or technologies that we uh, successfully test and deploy in one area are not then successfully tested and deployed in another area but are actually, uh, it all becomes part of the same system and everything is done kind of at scale is kind of our, our, our main approach. Um, and as I say, our focus really is about that kind of tried and tested approach at the moment. Yes, we have uh, a separate arm which is looking at how we can embed new innovative approaches. We have we've set up an innovation institute called the Digital Health and Care Institute, which is really about uh, providing support to SMEs and looking at how new app-based technology, how smart technology, wearables, trackers, etc., can benefit our health and care system. But ultimately, they have to have somewhere to go. You can test all these things as much as you like, but once, once it's been tested, once it's been evaluated, once it's been shown to be effective, so what? Uh, and that's kind of the, the approach that we're looking at now in Scotland, is how can you create that entire pathway from small-scale innovation right the way through to large-scale, mainstream, um, normalized delivery. Uh, and I quite like the, the, the idea um, mentioned earlier about actually moving this from a marginalized zone where, let's face it, this, this agenda has been relatively marginalized for the last decade or so and actually taking this as part of um, our, our, our business as usual, our, our standard offering to what we, we can provide to our, our, uh, our clients, our, our patients, our citizens. Um, and it's also about recognizing that this isn't just the NHS that is in on this, it's, it's also our social care colleagues and local authorities, it's our housing providers. Some of the most innovative approaches to looking after people are actually in the housing sector. Uh, and you know, they are 
perhaps several years ahead of where we are in the NHS because they don't have the same kind of restrictions that we do in terms of some of our IT protocols, some of the data sharing issues. They can just invest in the, in the latest technology and the latest software platforms. So actually I think if you look at that entire uh, partnership approach between the different statutory providers and non-statutory providers, everybody has I think a different uh, approach to play here. They have a different part to play. and. Uh, what we're trying to do in Scotland is to make sure that everybody is actually able to provide the best outcomes for our citizens. And the last point that I want to uh, focus on just, just before I sit down and we, t and we start taking some questions is about the, the future and how we're actually um, progressing this. This is a good opportunity, this particular panel and, and this conference, to shape what we're doing in Scotland. Uh, we're in the process now of coming up with a new strategy for the next three to five years, covering technology-enabled care in, in, its, in its broadest sense. Uh, we're very much in the early days of developing that, as in I think we have about three pages of thoughts um, before we go anywhere public with it. But we're very, very keen to kind of learn from everything that's going on, both within Scotland, but also within the rest of the UK, in terms of what can you tell us that, we th that you think we should be focusing our activity on the next three to five years? Where do you think the opportunities are? We all know about the challenges, uh, but it's about the opportunities and how we, over uh, how we overcome some of these challenges. So I personally am very keen to hear from you over the next couple of days. I'll be around for the next couple of days. So even if you're not allowed, able to answer any, ask any questions just now, then please feel free to come and approach us because, as I say, we're very, very keen to get as much of your expertise captured in, in the documents that we produce. So, thank you. Right, if I can invite everyone to come back up to the podiums, please. Um, we're now going to move into uh, the sort of debate stage with some questions. And these questions have been shaped by the uh, Twitter debates over the last few weeks. And uh, I've got a number of questions. Some I'm going to direct to one or two contributors and uh, some uh, towards the end uh, to, to all. But we've had some really, uh, I think, useful messages already about the uh, different perspectives. The fact that we have four flavors here, the benefit of devolution, we can see things being tried in slightly different ways. So in the uh, introduction from the minister just now, he talked about the shift from a 20th century model of healthcare, which is very much one around fixing and repairing people, to one that is more around health and well-being and keeping people active and well, uh, where data and information is really uh, at the heart of it and is in the hands of the patient, the carer, as well as the healthcare professionals. And I, I'd be particularly interested to, to get Deborah and Paul's views about uh, how, what they think the key actions are that can make that sort of vision a reality of a, a focus more on well-being and and health maintenance rather than on fixing the problems later. Deborah. Okay. Well, government has a role to play um, in terms of trying to fix that and trying to focus on well-being because at the minute our focus is very much on dealing with what is presented to us and therefore it's very hard, and I said in my opening remarks, you know, about being reactive. We need to look forward in terms of um, trying to prevent people um, becoming ill and keeping them at home as long as possible, living independent, fruitful lives out there. In terms of... Um, the, the, the mechanisms, I mean, we have strategies and policies, and um, we all have loads of strategies and policies, and probably gathering dust on a shelf somewhere, but we, all, we need to work together um, with other departments, for example, in terms of education and housing. We need um, to empower patients and very attractive to the idea that, um, and the demand indeed, for patients to have access to their own information so that they can take more power in terms of managing their conditions. I mean, if you can book your holiday online, you should be able to go on and read your results and, and know what that means online. Um, so, and there's an opportunity to be had in terms of making use of the best technology and indeed some of which is downstairs in the conference area um, in terms of developing health and wellbeing um, and using those important tools. Our challenges will be obviously how we interface with health and care electronically and addressing that and also making sure that whenever we are sharing information um, with, with patients and carers, more so than maybe we have done to date, that information is accurate and up to date and that the devices that they use to do this are valid, compliant and they have agreed standards. And because if we don't have that in terms of the clinicians behind it and their confidence in terms of supporting this technology, they won't do that unless they can see the accuracy um, in relation to that. Um, in terms of some of the actions that we have been taking, as I said earlier, 
collaboration is important, ecosystems are important, health and innovation, life science hubs are important. Role to Thank play. you very much, Deborah. And um, Paul, in particular, I'm very interested. You mentioned vanguards and the program that's taking place. Uh, how, how can they contribute to this sort of agenda and actually enable perhaps many in this room have real meaningful conversations about delivering some of the offerings that currently are available to, to move this agenda forward? I, th I think I've got the crooner's mic rather than the, the Britney headset, so I'll uh, <laughs> use this one. Um, so uh, the, the vanguards are a real opportunity. I mean, they are looking beyond the traditional organizational boundaries and structures that we know have really caused real structural difficulties in terms of people working, uh, working differently. I mean, I, I'd like to echo some of what Deborah said in this context and also pick up what Alistair said, which is, is the opportunity for really new partnerships here. I mean, I think... I don't want to use the phrase the younger generation, but I think a generation of people will be happy to walk into their John Lewis and leave with their Fitbit, leave with those pieces of technology that are lifestyle related and will engage with those and will manage differently. I think some of the population that we're talking about living with long term conditions will expect to have the advocacy and the support of health and care professionals. They will not easily necessarily move to these, these sorts of technology supported environments without that level of support. So we have to bring the professionals, the supplier base and, and the communities together. And we have to look for new partners to enable us to do that. Um, so if there is a relationship that you've got with a third sector partner, a voluntary sector partner, then they're the people who help us unlock this opportunity going forward. But I'm a little bit selfish as well. I'm a little bit greedy too, because I think the presumption of the question almost is that the health and care system, which is the one that fixes is somehow is somewhere stuck. And isn't, I, we, we can use technology absolutely in the context of that aspect of care as well. One of our colleagues mentioned variation. That's variation often the experience that people have of models of care today. So we should use the technology and use the insights from the data to tackle the health and care system we've got and to help us build the health and care system we want. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And I think that's an important point, that it's not, uh, it's not either or, it's both. And I think uh, that, that's part of what's op the opportunity here. Um, the NHS and uh, social care really do face some significant demand and cost pressures. Um, we've heard about the, the growing funding gap um, and we've heard some appropriate pushback that it shouldn't just be about the challenges, that it also ought to be about the opportunities. So, Ivan, I wondered if you could uh, say something about realistically what sort of savings might be expected from digital health and technology-enabled care and also McKinsey, who'd been talked about as uh, the producer of a report, whether that report gives us any clues as to the sort of other side of that equation, which is the investment costs as well. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just on. Should, can I borrow? Uh, it's on. It's on. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think um, th there are efficiencies that can be generated from. Uh, changing the way that we deliver healthcare services, but they don't ascribe solely to the technology. Um, this, this is a quote, I don't know where it's from, but it's, it's a sensible sentence as well, I guess. Um, if you have a, a chaotic and inefficient system and you add technology, then you have a chaotic and inefficient system with technology. The, the important thing is that technology is changing us from the way that we deliver care now to something different. And in that regard, it's a, it's a tool for, for making our uh, delivery of healthcare services more efficient, and they can do that in a whole host of different ways by cutting out travel, which would be a lot of sort of telemedicine, telecare, and other things, helping the right person to get in touch with the patient or to be on the other end of that. But it's also about data and analyzing variation. So I, I do believe that there is significant scope for efficiency. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the challenge probably is that we're we're not as good as we might be at demonstrating. Um, those opportunities and we're certainly not as good as we could be at uh, evidencing really credibly and persuasively and capturing the efficiencies because it's not just about the cash, it's also about other resources. I'd rather focus a little bit maybe on the word investment and in, in the public sector we use the word investment as a proxy for spending um, um, but I come from a private sector background and investment um, really does focus on, on the return. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's really important that we find and capture that return and uh, also I think that we recognize that there's a return for more than just the payer or the health provider. There is often um, in, in, in these partnership projects a return uh, for the industry partner um, and there, there tends to be a presumption that it is um, 
the public sector's job to pay the upfront cost of this um, in an environment where we know that there's a really limited headroom to do that, and I understate. It's probably a sort of a negative headroom if such a thing even exists. Um, and that's forecast in, into the future. So the ability for the public sector in the conventional manner of freeing up some additional public capital to be able to pay for stuff, see whether they work, um, I, I think you know, we're seriously uh, constrained in our ability to do that, although in Wales, you know, I, I, de I deliver a fund that makes additional money available to health boards um, and to local authorities in the past um, to develop and, and demonstrate some of these things, but it is very much about the demonstration and the rapid evaluation. So I do think we need to explore models of ways that this can more clearly pay for itself um, and um, maybe a more honest appraisal of, of investment and the return value to the industry partner um, or to other people who are involved in this. Um, and we also have to think about how patients will take some of the load themselves. So, so we, we can spend on a project that will demonstrate a load of telecare technologies um, with, you know, let's say, a thousand patients, but that's really quite expensive. Um, we have three million people living in Wales, we have over 60 million people living in the UK, and realistically, the government can't buy these devices for every single person across the whole of the, whole of the UK. So um, some of it is, is going to have to think about how we can do that efficiently and use devices that are already there, um, which are very you know, potent devices generally, um, in ways that enable us to get to where we all, I think, agree that we could get to. Can I just pick you up on one thing, which was you, you rightly in your talk and in your answer just now gave us a bit of a challenge about demonstrating, having ability to measure and provide evidence. Can you give us an example of where that has succeeded so far? Give us a tool or an approach that has enabled us to make much more obvious the, uh, the benefit so far. Yeah, I mean, we, we've... I try to talk about innovation in and innovation out, so there are certain cases where uh, the NHS in Wales had one of the very first spin-outs from the NHS anywhere. This is 25 years ago. Um, it, it, was a, it was maggots, actually. For, it's called larval debridement therapy. That company is still going. That's an opportunity where there was an industry partner, there was an NHS partner, and the value was the demonstration that that was clinically efficacious and then taking it to market, and they're just going into the US market now. These things do take a long time. So that's, that's, that's one model. Um, there are also a number of sort of social enterprise and not-for-profit limited by guarantees companies. Uh, in, in Wales, two years ago, we established a wound innovation center. Wounds is a, um, is, is, a, um, is a significant burden on the NHS. It generally isn't recognized as a special, specialty in itself. Um, so diabetic specialists will deal with wounds of that type. Um, but it's a real tractable challenge that we can address. And that, that's been established as a company not-for-profit, limited by guarantee, which is expected to capture the value of what it does in a better way. And even if, if it doesn't capture the value, at least it is making the effort to focus on the value to different partners, um, industry, the NHS itself, university partners and others, in ways that we, we, we don't find very easy to do generally. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to a question to Alistair, if I may. Um, the minister told us how important it is to inspire both patients and I think perhaps particularly uh, frontline staff, uh, health professionals and so on, to, uh, to really embrace and see this as the default mode to, uh, to prescribe and use uh, technology-enabled care. Um, what approaches have worked so far? How, what's the best way? We've been told that, uh, that staff are full of ideas. Uh, how do we bridge the gap between those ideas and, and their implementation? And how do we close the gap between those clinicians and many of the people in this room? Um, I, think there's, uh, I think there's almost two elements to that. There's one about actually wanting to use this in the first place. And I think a large element um, is, is taking away the fear of using technology and having technology imposed on staff. Uh, I, I know especially a lot of frontline staff, they see it as a threat to their jobs, they see it as a threat to the face-to-face the -face care that they provide, but actually it, it shouldn't be. It should be seen as an opportunity for them. It should be an opportunity for them to actually see the right people with the right needs as opposed to seeing absolutely everybody because not everybody actually needs to have uh, intensive face-to-face -face care. Um, so it's about actually allowing them to do as much of the jobs they train for in the first place. So some of that is about using technology more to, to enable them to do their jobs more efficiently. Um, and when it comes to kind of clinical engagement as well, in terms of how you, how you win that battle, I think as well, you, you have to actually show that the technology doesn't just benefit from the patients, but it has to benefit the staff as well. It has to be um, a bit like Ivan said in terms of general efficiencies, it's not about adding it on to your existing day job, it's about how you transform your day job to free up more time to see more patients. 
Um, and I think that's a large, um, uh, a large battle to still be won. Um, it, it's by no means that we cracked that. Uh, but in terms of how we actually uh, encourage uh, members of, of staff and, and clinicians and, uh, and whatnot to come up with some of these ideas and present some of these ideas, I think the NHS, the NHS in particular has thrived in innovations for the last 50 years. You know, yes, we haven't fundamentally changed the basic model of the NHS perhaps in, in 50 years, but it's still an unrecognisable service to what it was in 1948. And that wouldn't have happened if we had not fought, uh, had a, a culture of innovation throughout our NHS. There is opportunities for people to come up with new ideas and new approaches. There always has been. Our challenge centrally, I don't think, is about allowing that innovation to, to take place. It's about how we capture the right innovation and how we then take what has been an innovative approach in one area and spread it to another area. I think that, to me, is the big challenge nationally. Innovation happens every single day of every single week. It's about how we actually make the most of that innovation is the real challenge. Thank you. And I've got a sort of question which picks up on that theme of my question to all three of you, or four of you rather now. Um, it, it's, we've got a, a number of startups that are in the exhibition area here today. We've got uh, many of the, the big players in the industry here as well, uh, sitting in this conference wanting to uh, get your input into how um, they get to see the right people in health and care and housing. We've heard housing is perhaps in some cases uh, in, in the vanguard of all of this. To talk about, talk about what their offering is. Um, it would be really helpful to get some top tips from you. What gets them across the threshold and then what keeps them in the room having a conversation? If I start um, with Deborah and then just work my way down, that would be great. Um, what gets them in the room? Well, I suppose events like today have their place in terms of showcasing um, the technology um, and what can be done. Um, in terms of what gets them in the room, it's very difficult. And I know even um, we've talked about the innovation of the staff, um, which there are real heroes out there in terms of the staff. Um, and they too have problems um, finding their way around and knocking on doors to get um, access to see how they can take their innovations forward. So I suppose it's how do we um, it's build collaborative networks and therefore you know, we have the ecosystems. We will have our health and innovation life sciences hub. Um, and as well as that, we now have um, better, better um, innovation procurement partner, which we have appointed. So there's various things can be done. Um, but equally within the service, in terms of the staff, um, we also are looking, as I say, the minister has recently announced an innovation institute. And that's exactly to tackle some of the, the problems that we've heard about um, in terms of um, something happens in one area, how do we um, measure the benefits of that? How do we then scale it up and um, um, deliver it at scale? So it's very difficult, I, you know, and I recognise that. Um, and we need as a, as a service to find better ways to articulate how. And I think certainly things like our Health Innovation Life Sciences Hub will be a key part of that. Paul. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that there is a, there's a tension between the reason why you'll get into the room is your ability to make a contribution to today's problems at the same time as we're saying you're part of tomorrow's solutions with people. So there's, there's always a challenge around space. Um, you will get in and have conversations if you can contribute to the things that are most stressing boards, that are most stressing directors of finance, that are most stressing chief executives, that are most stressing medical directors. But that shouldn't be at the expense of a long-term and enduring relationship. I, I know that there are some colleagues in the exhibition area downstairs but working in academic health science networks, which are mm -hmm. an innovation of about 18 months duration in, in, in England. And I'm sure it will be useful for people in the conference today to go and talk to them because they've got an opportunity to think a bit more about lead time and about, and about pipeline. Um, but I'd just also make a, like to make a comment related to sort of, sort of the previous question. Is, is this benefits case thing? Um, I, I think one of the things we crucially have to do around technology is help the definition of benefits be expanded. If we simply have the definition of benefits associated with financial return on investment, technology will struggle to get its grip because actually it's the wider societal benefits. It's the whole opportunity to reshape the model of care that we want to tap into here. And I think new, uh, new entrants, those bringing innovation into this context, should be bold about saying their offer does contribute to the financial bottom line, but their offer contributes something much more sustainable and enduring than that. A lot in that answer and lots that we could debate, but we'll uh, pick it up again in a moment because it's on time. I think, there's a lot, there's a, I think there's a great deal to debate on 
everything that we've, we're talking about today. Yep. Um, it's not easy. I'm, I'm, not sh I'm, I'm not sure that it should be that easy because the time of clinicians and the chief executives of housing associations and local authorities and, and directors in those areas is valuable as well. And so it, it shouldn't be a completely free-for-all open door. Um, I'll put my neck on the block and say that if there's something that you're interested in doing in Wales, then you can get in touch with me. But I'll caveat that by saying that if what you want to do is to run a, a trial, a clinical trial or some other evaluative study, then I'll immediately refer you to, uh, to Health and Care Research Wales, which is an all Wales um, trial support facilitation service with accelerated ethics approvals and feasibility feedback and all the rest of it. If what you want to do, so, so that's us selling to you a service for trials um, where we're aiming to be more efficient at, at, and better at that um, than um, other competitor regions in the UK and internationally. Um, if, if it's you selling to us, then I'll pass you to procurement and we have an all Wales procurement hub, we have a single purchase ledger for the whole of the NHS in Wales and I'll get, let you talk to them. If it's not you selling to us and it's not us selling to you but it's something in between um, where there isn't money changing hands directly, um, then that's something where my team and I would support you um, to put you in touch with the right people and talk about some of these things about the value that you're seeking openly and the value that we're seeking and how we might do that jointly through a, a, a templated joint working agreement. Uh, and we've set up some partnerships of that kind or some joint working arrangements, I guess I should say, of that, of that type um, with large multinational pharmaceutical companies and with small and medium enterprises in Wales. But, but I do want to emphasize, if, if it's you selling to us, if it's a business development or a sales transaction, then you know, I'm, not, I'm not here to facilitate that other than to introduce you to procurement. Um, if it's us selling to you for trials, then go to the trials hub. If it's something in between, then, uh, then that's something that I'll be very interested in speaking to you about. Thank you very much. And finally, Alistair. Yeah, much, much like my colleagues in, uh, in the other three jurisdictions, I think there, there are a range of different approaches to doing this. Um, in terms of just getting collaboration together and everybody actually into a physical room, you know, we're quite good at, in, in Scotland at doing that. Um, whether we're uh, good at then taking it to the next step is, you know, perhaps somebody else might want to comment on that. But, you know, we have a, a number of tools at a national level as well. I, I mentioned in my opening remarks about the Digital Health and Care Institute, whose job very much is to work with, with industry uh, and academia uh, and indeed um, citizens directly in terms of actually testing and trialling out new technologies and new approaches. But in terms of if something is already at a more advanced stage, which has already been tested, we've actually introduced something in, in Scotland which covers not just digital health and care, but actually um, all innovations uh, in, in the broadest sense of the word, um, which is called the Health Innovation Assessment Portal. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a means by which um, companies in particular who, are, who have a new idea or a new approach or a, or a new product and they want to introduce it to the help, well, at the moment, the NHS in Scotland, then they go through this portal and that's then given to um, various experts within the health and care system in Scotland to kind of assess its applicability to, to our, our, our um, health care system in Scotland. Uh, and we have something similar um, for innovations that have been created by um, actual healthcare professionals uh, and some of the universities who are, are linked to the, some of the health boards, which is called Scottish Health Innovation Limited. And it's about kind of uh, supporting that kind of growth from uh, innovations that have been generated by, by uh, staff and turning them into actually marketable commodities. So as I say, there's a variety of different approaches and whilst we have you know, four slightly different approaches, they all have at, this, at, the, at the end you know, the, the same kind of goals, which you know, in, in Scotland's case is about growth of Scottish SMEs and Wales, Welsh SMEs, UK, probably all of Britain, but we'll take it in England probably most because that's where the biggest market is. Um, and the same in Northern Ireland, where you know there's there's a there's a huge growth potential here, uh, and I think that's reflected by the fact that it isn't just Scottish SMEs or Welsh SMEs, etc., but we are actually getting multinationals knocking our doors in this field, and you know so I think the opportunity is absolutely now to to get engaged. So. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, we've had a lot of violent agreement from our panelists today, um, a lot of common accord, but also some unique and distinct approaches to tackling some of the issues. And that's the great advantage of this conference. We're hearing uh, the different perspectives from the four nations and how the tech agenda is moving from the margins to the mainstream. Can we share our appreciation to our four contributors this morning to really get the conference off to a great start? Thank you very much.